Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. So Mark, when did you first become interested in aviation? Oh man, I hear from my mom and dad that believe it or not, a lot of people, um, you know, the first words is mama, dada, and mine was airplane. Because I grew, in fact, I've seen the pictures of, uh, you know, being raised by a fighter pilot, especially a combat fighter pilot. Uh, you get it from the, t from the time you come out. <laughs> and uh, my, my crib uh, where I had, uh, where most people have teddy bears and stuff like that one, you know, my crib that overlooked me, my dad had made uh, fighter models. And they're all hanging from my crib. So, yeah, there was, there was no question. I was uh, pretty much brainwashed. But, you know, it's a, I still thank my dad every day for i mean i feel like i was blessed that I, I i chose this career because it's a it was a it went over like that you know i can't believe how fast the uh, the whole experience went when i retired i was like where did it all go now so, do it all again <laughs> yeah i'll do it all again easily but uh we all know your dad uh, vic and we had him on the channel uh but he was in the air force so why did you join the navy mark well um a lot of it too is, you know, it's the spirit of the fighter pilot. Uh, we're we're all very competitive, you know, because, you know, they the, the movie Top Gun did say it had it right when it says there's no points for second place. When you're when you're a fighter pilot and you 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 go into the heat of battle, um, you know, you, you're going to come out alive or you come out dead. <laughs> you know, there there is no second place. Cool. You know, I mean. Okay, yeah, you might get bagged, and then you know, yeah, you might survive it, but now you're most likely going to be a prisoner of war. So either way, now you got to win all the time. So um, so that's one thing. So I was trying to compete with an iconic hero of the Vietnam War, my dad. But how can I, you know, I was like, man, how can you compete against you know a thud driver? So. Um, yeah, you know, I started thinking about Navy, and then of course, you know, I always felt deep inside a, a, a gratefulness for the the fact that the Navy rescued my father in North Vietnam, and so I was like, oh, we got to pay this back. We got to pay the Navy back. Uh, although I loved some of the stuff in the uh, you know the Air Force had the you know the the F fifteen Eagle, you know sixteen was coming online, so I loved those airplanes. But then I'll tell you what, it was. Um, I was in college and I was uh, visiting my mom and dad for a spring break. And the first thing he comes, he goes, he goes, hey, and he always called me boy. So it's funny. It's just, I mean, <laughs> he's a hey, boy. He says, yeah, you, uh, you've seen the movie Final Countdown. And I said, no, nah, no, I haven't seen it. He goes, let's go see it. So we went and sat. And I don't know if you've seen the movie Final Countdown. Uh, Kurt yeah. Oh, God, it's a great movie, you know. And um, when I saw the F-14s on the flight deck and then, then them going against the uh, Zeros and then, you know, in, a, in a dog fight, I, you know, I just said, oh, that's what I'm going to fly. That is the airplane I'm going to fly. And I, it, it just clicked. And I said, you know, I want to fly that airplane off the, the USS Nimitz. And then, you know, and just by the miracle of God, because everybody, you know, and then, of course, you know, the movie Top Gun came out. Then everybody wanted to do it. And um, so, and that came out just as um, I had gotten winged. Uh, so I really didn't have to compete too much because all the, the, the stuff was, was after, you know, I think it was released in 86 and I got winged early in 86. But still, it was always a competitive, uh, everyone wanted to fly the Tomcat. You know, even though the Hornet was just coming out, no, nope, nope, they wanted to fly the Tom because it's still by far the, the, the prettiest, most beautiful airplane ever built and it was so ahead of its day i mean it really was a uh, a, a, a um, technological miracle of what that thing could do is way ahead of its day it's kind of like the thug that's why my dad loves the thug because it's a way ahead of its time well so was the time time was a uh, way ahead of its time absolutely 
But that wasn't the first aircraft you got ported to. It was actually the A4. Can you tell us about this? Yeah, yeah. That's the problem is, you know, you work at the pleasure of the, the Navy. And, you you know, they give you a, a wish list once you've gone through it. And the training takes two years. Two, I mean, I was commissioned in 1984. I didn't get winged until 86. And, uh, and then you have to fight your way into that one, too, because the Navy has a lots of airplanes. They've got helicopters. They've got the maritime patrol, you know, so the P-3s were, the, you know, and those took a lot of pilots. So it was only yeah. the best of the best elite got to pick jets. And then even when you got to got into that selection in that pipeline, they, they called it pipelines. Uh, we start with the T-34, you know, turboprop, very basic. And you actually have to achieve a certain GPA just to even for them to, to be looked at to go into the jet pipeline. Wow. And uh, yeah, and a lot of guys that, that I went through primary with, they, they you know, they want to fly jets, but they didn't make the grades. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sad because you want your friends to do, you know, be right with you as you go. But a lot of them, you know, they, you know, they didn't make the grades. So I was just blessed that uh, I made the grades, got selected. But now I'm fighting for because at the time, believe it or not, it's, it's a lot different. You know, the Navy has changed its whole um, warfare planning in terms of the carriers and what's on the carriers for for efficiencies. You know, it's like mm -hmm. all horns, just all different types of horns. You know, but back in my days, man, they had A3s. A7s, A6s, F14s, S3s. I mean, it was just a whole smorgasbord of different platforms, weapon systems on that carrier. And of course, they had to fill all those slots. Well, pretty much everyone was like, eh, the Tomcat or, you know, or the Hornet. You know, mm -hmm. that, that's the ones they wanted. So you really had to, you know, just battle it out. And then, uh, and all based off of merit and performance. And so what happened was, I put on my list, but then it also comes in availability. What's what what slots are open that week that you happen to be winged? So it's and look as well that, in terms, I, yeah. And, yeah, and so you you know that's why your list goes a, a long ways. Hmm. And um, the week I got winged, there was um, no Tomcats, no A sixes, no Hornets. <laughs> I mean, it was just a. I'm like. Oh, what the and luckily I had put down on my list. I did not put S threes. I did not want S threes. Uh, in fact, I only think I, I only think I put down A six. I put down I put Tomcats first choice, Hornets second, uh, A sevens because I figured the A sevens would be eventually going out, maybe going to Hornets anyway. So I was okay. I'll take that one. And then my fourth choice, believe it or not, was I saw. I'm also a big time. I, I served all through high school and college. So I was a big surfer. And I saw that there's a squadron in Hawaii <laughs> that flew A4s in a composite squadron. Because by, by that time, the A4s were, were really getting retired from the Navy fleet. They were, they were no longer on carriers. They were just in these specialty squadrons called uh, fleet composite squadrons. Right. And they actually had special duties uh, just for that aircraft. Um, and missions for that aircraft. So I said, okay, I'll just, I'll just take the, you know, I'll just put it down. I got to put down something. And sure enough, uh, that's what I got. So I was the the lone A4 in my my class week, and the rest were all S3s. So I was like, Phew. you know, I lucked out to A uh, the Toms, which I wanted. Uh, but now in reflection, oh my God, that was the best, best experience I ever had because I didn't get Hawaii, by the way. They had actually had the, the comp composite squadrons. They had one in Hawaii. They had one in the Philippines because this is when we still had the, the QB point in the mm -hmm. Philippines. And they had one in Puerto Rico. And they had one in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And, and that's the one that had the most unique mission. And that's the one I got. And I look back and that was, you know, in fact, one time my dad and I were having lunch. He goes, he goes boy, you've had, you know, boy, you had, you've had quite the career. What, what was your favorite squadron? And I, you know, and it's kind of hard because it's like picking children. You love, you, you know, you, you love all the guys you fly with, all the guys you meet, and they're all different. Yeah. Every squadron is. Uh, but the one I keep on thinking, I just smile every time I, I think of it and reflect back on it. And it was my first squadron was was Vietmo, and it was because it was so unique, and and we we're so far removed in Guantanamo Bay. I mean, here talk about a base surrounded in a communist country. 
of all places. Yeah. And the mission of the of the A4 down there, they still had the strike fighter role because we were, the, the Marines were there. And we actually had to defend the Marines. So we're constantly working close air support missions, dropping live ordnance, rock guys, snakes, um, you know, the uh, Mark 82 snakes, you know. So you come in roll low and, and do pitch up rollover attacks. And, oh, man, it was just a blast. And then so you had that mission and then you had the, the fleet support missions. So the carriers would come down and we'd be providing DACT for um, uh, for the fleet. So next time I'm fighting Tomcats, I mean, Hornets, and it sounds and like it was just, almost. Sorry to interrupt, Mike. It was like a hidden gem on that dream sheet, almost. It was. I had no idea, yeah. and I and and the and the beauty about it was, gosh, to operate out of a communist country, the rules <laughs> were there. Were rules. I mean, it's just, we would just we would take off. I mean, you didn't have to worry about cities all over the place. You didn't have to worry about the FAAA. You just would just take off. And literally, I'm still on tower, and they clear me right into the target. I mean, as I'm taking off, I'm just like taking off, gears up, master arm on, <laughs> roll in. And then because the range is it's only a 40 square mile um, base, and so it was it was, a, it was an absolute blast. And I tell you what, also my CO was a Vietnam A4 driver, so I got a lot of information from him. I had another guy, uh, a, a lot of old uh, salts that were in that squadron. Mm-hmm. And I learned a lot from them. I really did. And um, yeah, my, my XO at the time was a Tomcat guy. And, and you know, and just learning to fight the, um, the fleet, it's, I was an ensign. And I just, I, I think I learned a lot to go. And then at the end of that tour, they, the Navy says, yeah, first shot, whatever you want. And, and then so I said, Phew. Tomcats, Miramar, you know, and I, and so I was going to go there. And the only thing about that one was really funny was when my orders came through, and like, you know, next thing you know, I'm seeing my orders, and they gave me Tomcats, uh, Miramar. My, I get called into the uh, the EXO's office, and he goes, and he kind of, I don't want to say chew me out, but he just go, why, why the Tomcats <laughs> old, you know? Because and this, by this time, this is like eighty seven, eighty eight time frame. Go, Tomcats old. Why didn't you take the Hornet? Why, you know, it's, it's the newest, it's the greatest. And I, I, I just went, because it's the Tom, <laughs> it's a Tomcat. It's, a, it's an incredible airplane. I'll, no, the explanation needed right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I said, you know what? I said, you, I said, I will fly the Hornet later on because the Tomcat, you know, because I planned to make a full career out of this thing. And the Tomcat, I knew the Tomcat was going to retire. Where would he go? He'd go to the Hornet. So I said, I'll fly the Tom, I'm going to horn it later, but I'm, i got to fly this Tom, you know, and, and so that's how that, that all worked out. Indeed. But I do want to tell you this one story, uh, because I did have an opportunity. I mean, I flew with a lot against a lot of con- other countries when I was in the fleet off the carriers, because, you know, you go around the world and you're, you're working with different air forces. Uh, but I was on the West Coast, and so we really did not do too much with Europe. We mostly did stuff in the Far East. Um, and, uh, so what ended up happening was when I was in A4s, we were, we were part of a big, um, exercise. It was a, it was a international exercise. And so they contacted the, Hey, you guys, you fly, you, you do fleet support, uh, DACT adversary. We, we, we kind of need you guys over here. Come on over here. And so we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know we were going to go come against the U S fleet or cause they said international next, thing you know, we're, we find is that we're supposed to attack the, uh, the HMS Ark Royal. And, Ooh. and so, and I'm like, Whoa, we're and, and these guys, you know, I knew we'd be going against sea harriers that were combat proven cause they, yeah. cause of the, the, the Falcon Islands. And so what ended up happening was that they said, OK, your job is to attack the HMS Ark Royal. So, you know, in the brief, we said, yeah, OK, yeah. so we got together. We said, OK, we're going to I said, we're going to come in the weeds. We're trying to get below the radar and uh, we're going to do the speed of heat the fastest as this little A4 can go. And we're going to try to attack, uh, attack this, this great carrier. So, so we're coming in there. And they and luckily they did get you know they did help us out and we they actually gave us a controller off okay. of the Ark Royal so to kind of give us a, a balance you know because I we had no radar in the yeah of course. 
know, it's like, so we're, and we're down, like I said, we're down about 300, 300 feet, right out of the, right out of the water, come in to attack. Cause we knew we had the vectors in, but we knew that the Harriers would be orbiting, capping, you know, combat air patrolling. So that we knew that, you know, that we we're going to have to break through that, that, uh, that defensive shield. So next thing you know, and, and I, and I love your guys' accents. I, I just do, you know, and so it, it was like, right, we're going to, you know, and so they give me these calls from the art world. They said, you have, you have a contact and they start, and you can tell that they're coming behind, you know, coming behind us mm-hmm. like that. So we're, so, you know, they're, they're giving vectors and we're still st- straight on the target. So we're looking, we're looking and I'm tra- I keep looking over. I'm not even flying lead. I'm, I'm flying wing. Right. We have a, our, our uh, I can't remember who was leading the squad. I mean, leading that mission. But so I'm sitting there flying off the wing, but I'm also looking, I'm trying to find out the guy that's coming in, that's, that's breaking through. And I can't see. And, and, and all you keep on hearing from all the little scooters, the A4s, is like, no joy, no joy. And the, and the, and the guy was kind of getting like, right. <laughs> he was like, I was saying, why can't you see this guy? Because he was coming in. And then finally he says one thing that finally takes us to our eyes in the right spots. He goes, he goes right, he's now at your four o'clock low. We're at 300 feet. And so we're like, so now we take our eyes looking up, looking down. down yeah. Sure enough, 300 feet, I'm seeing the sea harriers coming up. I mean, they are like almost put up rooster tails wow. below. And they, yeah, they, they bagged us all. So. Wow, what an <laughs> incredible story. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I got, I got a lot of respect for those guys. I, I couldn't believe they were coming in that low. So we try to take them up to fight because, you know, our rules of engagement are we cannot dogfight uh, yeah. below. The uh, the hard deck and the hard deck for us is five thousand feet. So we're you know because I wanted to I you know I don't know about the other guys I wanted to I wanted to fight these guys you know mm. train. Yeah. So I was like you know immediately I saw him I just went straight in the vertical trying to get above get five thousand feet so we can mess mess with a bit you know it's like. We're gonna. Uh continue on to your your next path we t- you briefly talked about the f-14 so it was your favorite the aircraft you wanted to go on to but uh, what was the role of the tomcat when you uh, joined the fleet yeah that because it, it, it you know it did a transformation there you it know did. it was designed as a, as a fleet defense fighter and even though grumman in their wisdom they put in attack uh software in there they actually had little buttons that you pick and and change our HUD to give us an attack roll. Uh, I'll be, you know, because, you know, again, this is 60s technology. We didn't have the, you know, the lantern didn't come yeah. until the 90s. So, um, but we never trained to it. You know, when, when I got to the fleet, no, our primary mission was, it is, you know, you have a, a fleet defense mission. You are to defend the, <laughs> defend the fleet at all costs. So we, you know, we'd be doing the alert fives because, you know, the, at that time, you know, there still was a Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, they, they'd always be sending out their bears and to, and they want, you know, they wanted to fly over the, the carrier. And our job was to intercept them and try to keep them away. But you know, they always just, we were in a war, but it was a, it was a cold war, and you know, it was is interesting. To, you know, you go up and down, and uh, um, I did. Let me see. So to answer your question, yeah, it was it was just a pure uh, fighter. And the beauty about the the, uh, the Tomcat was, again, she was so far ahead of her time. I mean, the, the Og-9 radar was like, oh, it, yeah. oh, my God, that thing. I remember, uh, and then the TCS, the TCS, yeah. you, know, you know, again, 60s technology, the cockpit, you looked at it, and it was like, it's kind of digital. <laughs> you, go, you actually had a digital, dis, uh, yeah. somewhat of a digital display one, and then of course we had the the repeat of what our our, our real, you know, you know, the Ogni radar and the yeah. huge tracking and you know, multi-targeted tracking. Um, but then you could actually turn the uh, the TCS, and you know, if he locks on, he can slew the TCS radar. Uh, excuse me, the Ogni radar to the TCS, and you can pick up. No kidding, the camera of who you're, you're targeting. 
oh, and get cool. a visual visual ID. And I'll tell you, here's here's an amazing one. We were off the coast of, um, and this is back in, God, I think it was eighty nine, maybe. Yeah, eight, yeah, I think it, eight, eighty eight or eighty nine. And just to and, clarify for this story, you were in the uh, Tomcat A at the moment, F fourteen A. Yeah. Tomcat A, yeah. yeah. At that time, the, that was that was all that was there. Is the F eighteen? Uh, excuse me, the F fourteen A, and then they came out with the A plus, which they eventually changed to the B. Right. So it went from. Yeah, they, but initially they called it the F fourteen A plus, and they only had two squadrons on the west coast that just went there and they're tra- doing the transition. You know, brought in, took out that crappy TF thirty engine, which is. Oh my God, that was. We might get onto that big... later, Mark. But uh, carry on with your great story you were going to go on to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's a whole story right there. It is, so, yes. <laughs> uh, but, but but bottom line is the uh, we're off the coast of v- Vietnam, and sure enough, they had they had go ahead and put bear bombers in Vietnam, and they're launching out of uh, out of Vietnam to come see the carrier. So we're sitting there, and we're just sailing. You know, we were going to over 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 Vietnam. I think we're heading to the Gulf or something. And then um, what ended up happening was the, uh, I was on alert five. And, you know, there's, um, you're always, in a fighter squadron, you're always at some, some stage of alert. And they actually had alert 60s, alert 15s, and alert fives. And you got into the, the, the cycle you, and you just started. And you're always in these cycles for four hours. So you, you know, alert 60 means that, okay, you're alert 60, you got 60 minutes to be airborne. So you can just literally, be in your flight suit. And that's about it, you know, because you can race and you know, mm-hmm. you you know, you you be able to, to get up everything and be airborne in, in sixty minutes. But then suddenly, after four hours of doing that, you went to alert fifteen. So now you got to actually put the gear on, and now you stay in the red room. So now you're sitting around with all the flight gear on. Do that for four hours, and then after you you and you always relieve the, the next station. So, and then, so, so you've already stood alert for eight hours, right? 60 for four, 15 for four. Now you do the last four as alert five. And now you're in the airplane. So you're sitting in the airplane and this is all, I mean, if if there's not flight operations, there is an alert cycle. So some weird hours, sometimes you're there like three, four o'clock in the morning and stuff. And you've already been up for 12 hours, you know, yeah. and that was one of those weird ones. And, um, but it's during the day we're coming down there and we're doing the cycle and we're in the cockpit and next, thing you know, we hear the, you know, launch the alert. So, and then, it, then it becomes, a, believe it or not, it becomes a race because there's at, during my time, uh, flying the Tom was there two Tomcat squadrons per carrier. And so what you do is they'd have alert five and we'd have alert five. Mm-hmm. And depending on the threat, they either launch both of them, and then you, you'd operate as a section, or they just launch one just to take a peek, see what's what's going on in that one. So, so you you never knew what was going to happen. So you always prepared for the worst, being it's going to just be one, and you always wanted to beat the sister squadron. We always call them Brand X. You know, you had to beat them. So literally, when you heard launch the alert five, and usually your your sister squadron be alert right next to you. So you're just you're sitting there as you're doing it, as you're you're looking at them and you're starting and it's a race. You feel like you're in the you know they they Daytona 500 trying to race to get to the catapult to be shot off. But sure enough, we won the race. We get shot off, and then next thing you know, we're the only one going. And they're saying they go um, bogey bears, boom, and they give us a vector and we start going. And I had a great reel, and he locked him up. God, I think it was like 140 miles away, and. Uh, yeah. So and, and then and we so we we, we said uh, say you know say arm stats you know is, is it going to be red or free you know because we need to know do I do I need to go master arm on this thing and you know what's what what is the threat and so we're coming in and uh, but they had no ID they wanted you know it was a, it, they weren't giving us a a beyond visual range until ID right. and so 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 immediately when he locked on at 140 I said. I go, hey, quick, give me, give me the TCS, uh, salute to the TCS. So, boom, I switched my, you know, my, my display up to the, the TCS display, and sure enough, I can see it. I can see this little dot. And so I'm trying to get some aspects to see if I can ID this thing, because we had no idea. Is this a bear or is this a international airline liner? We had no idea. So now we're just looking at the um, the, the the range go down because we're, we're 
we're going the speed of heat, trying to make this intercept to get, we want to intercept them as far away from the carry as possible. So we're coming up there and sure enough, I'm, I see getting down, I'm getting down into the, you know, the uh, hundred and teens section, you know, it's like going, and I'm trying to really looking at this thing, trying to make out and the beauty thing about this one day was it was just crystal uh, skies. I mean, there's there not much, the visibility was outstanding. And then we had a great TCS camera because those yeah. were, you never knew which kind of quality camera you were going to get. <laughs> you had to clean everything. Like that. It was all, it was just a perfect, you know, perfect storm where I could see everything. And sure enough, at a hike, it was about 104 miles. I was able to identify and it was a Boeing 747. Wow. And I said, I came up and I said, hey, negative, it's a Boeing 747. It just launched out of of uh, annoying. 104 <laughs> miles there. Yeah, 104 miles ID, and they just said, "Okay, come on back." Boom, we just, we just came on back. So held overhead and went down, to recover. Oh, so, damn. I mean, what a story again. I'm sure we're going to get in some more stories, but I'm going to go into a bit nitty gritty here, Mark. And um, so, yeah, tell us what the aircraft, the F-14, was like to fly, and what were its oh. strengths and weaknesses uh, for you. Okay. <laughs> well, I kind of mentioned it a little before. Was yeah. the, the I talk about the weakness? I mean, because you know, I, actually, I think I think I probably lost some friends because of, of, of the the TF thirty. The TF thirty was the big, biggest piece of crap engine you ever, you know, and I it, it really caught me by surprise because I didn't really know about it, and I don't know why. No one really kind of it's almost like no one even talked about it. Um, so when I came from the A fours in from Gitmo. And, which I was used to flying the uh, uh, DACT with with Tom Cat before, so I knew how they fought, they fought but from a, a, a uh, adversary or aggressor perspective. And you know, a lot of things was that the biggest threat is uh, nose position, and also you you, you want to make sure you don't get in a weapons envelope, an IR weapons envelope. All right, so sometime. To do that, to to uh, not get shot from an IR sidewinder missile, sometimes you actually had to to learn. In the A4, we did it all the time because we'd be going up sometimes one A4 against two to four Tomcats. So you know you can fight some, but you can't fight them all. So and when you saw a threat coming, a you know a nose position threat where you're going to get t you know tagged by a, a, a sidewinder, you'd actually take the throttle all the way to idle to try to, to take down that IR signature. Okay. So I was used to that, you know, so when I'm fighting the A4, man, I was like, sometimes I, you know, my, my left arm was going like this, you know, because it wasn't a threat. You went far. It was a threat. Whoa, you got to get, yeah. you know, like that it's to save from getting shot. Well, the problem was now I'm in the fleet. I've been through the RAG, which is the replacement air group, which trains you in the transition from, you know, from another web platform to the platform you'll be flying in. So they call it the replacement air group, old lingo. It's really the FTRF, I mean, FRS, you know, Fleet Replacement Squadron. But we, we like tradition in the Navy, and we like to call it the RAG, you know. Yeah. So, but I didn't get that, I did not get that memo in the RAG about that. So next thing you know, and I, when I finished up the RAG, I went right to the fleet and then right on cruise, right, right on deployment. And now we're in uh, a big exercise. It's called. Uh, it was a big exercise they hold every year with the Air Force called Cope Thunder. I think it was. It's been so darn long. Yeah, that rings uh, a bell. Yeah, yeah I think that's Someone what it was. Someone will correct us in the comments, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, we're, talk we're talking like 1989, I think yeah. it was. And so what ends up happening is I'm going to get some eagles out of Clark, and. Um, and by the and on that one, when we do these exercises, the 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 carrier would go to a flex deck. I don't know if uh, your your uh, viewers know what a, a carrier flex deck is. Normally, it's uh, the carriers are on a cycle. You know, it, it could be a uh, a ninety minute cycle or a two hour cycle. But you know, they launch, recover, launch, recover, and then they yeah. do so many cycles, and then they shut down for the night, and then you go on alerts. Cool. Okay. So, and then, you know, it'd be pretty much even Steven, you'd have day ops, night ops, but in that. Well, for some exercises like Cope Thunder, you go into flex deck where 
there is no cycles. They're just launching and recovering, launching and recovering, you know? And, and so that one, we got launched and I was a single. So I'm going out there alone, alone and unafraid in this exercise, going against eagles for God's sake. You know, they got, they got a better thrust to rate ratio than Tom, you know, they got the, the uh, their, their GE engines and stuff. So, uh, and I got the, you know, the crappy TF thirties, a lot of power for the crappy engine. And what happened was I, I, I get to this engagement and I'm going against four of them, four eagles, you know, the eagle claw coming at you. Uh -oh. So I'm like, crap, you know, <laughs> so I go right up the middle, go in the vertical to check, see, all right, which, where, you know, who's going to be the bigger threat. And so I said, so I said you know, and I tell my real, hey, take the guys to, you know, to the west. I'll take the guys to the east. Keep track of these guys. If they start threatening, let me know. So I'm in full burner, you know, going straight at vertical. And next thing you know, so I'm walking and about ready to take which one I'm going to be a bigger threat to turn to. And he goes, hey, they're, nose, they're getting the nose on like that. So I know I'm going to be the big IR threat because, the, the, you know, the, the Tom has those big old hot engines coming out of there. So I immediately pull in like this, vertical, pull out, geez, and I just went slam the, the throttles out of zone five afterburner back to idle. And guess what? There's that. That's the sheet, the crappy part of the, uh, the TF-30. You can't do that. Yeah. Once I found the hard way is once you're in a dogfight, your hand almost you just got to just lock it into burner really? and yeah yeah you have to control the engines either that or it, it, then you got to do something like do an unload and go like you know one g and then slowly it's it's and that's you not can't, what you want in that in like in that scenario yeah you don't want to be in that scenario yeah and and you just you can't do it because next thing you know and the, and i should have realized that was that you know you got these two big uh, stall indicators up on the, you know, on each side of the, which represents the engine. And next, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it has this Christmas this, lights, this unique, <laughs> unique sound. It's, it's not a very pleasant sound. You know that, Hey, I just blown out my two engines with they're, they're, they're now in a, a compressor stall. So, so the worst case scenario is now I'm like, I'm like, you know, I'm going vertical. You know, and I, I've blown out both engines in the compressor stall. So then my immediately look was like, oh, and then the plane immediately departs. So now I'm out, I'm in out of control flight and mm -hmm. slowly trying to get into a spin here. And so I immediately look to my engines and I know I'm going to have to shut one of them down because if you were looking at the TIT because when the compressor stall, you, you, that's when you start overheating the engines and that's yeah. when it can explode and and. So and damage the engine where you're not, you're not gonna get that engine back again. Mm -hmm. So I nearly look at it. One's hanging low. The other one I can see start seeing it start, starts going up. You know, I was like, okay, this one's overheating. So I immediately shut that engine down. So now I'm out of control. One engine shut down. One engine stalled. So so now okay now I gotta recover the airplane. So I'm going stick forward neutral out lock your harness. You know, the throttles are already idle. Those, those are all the bold face procedures that you have to memorize to to try to get out of out of departure. And so, and meanwhile, I'm like going, and and you know, it's an exercise. So we're not really talking to the eagles. You're talking. I can't. We're usually talking to like our own controller, which is an E2. But I'm just like going, hey, and and this is how crazy you are. You know, when you're when you're young, I'm I'm a young lieutenant at the time. You one thing you is you think you're you're invincible. You 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 think that you you're immortal. Nothing's ever going to happen to you. And I'm not kidding. I I told my real it's like keep an eye on them. <laughs> in me, in my eyes, we're still in the fight. I just got to uh, get this thing going to start so I can get right yeah. back into the fight. So sure enough. You know, I, I, I get the aircraft back in the in control, and then now I just like, I got to get this one, because about this time, the other one starts creeping up on the uh, on the, the TIT, the temperatures. It starts going up. I'm going, okay, yeah, I think it's been long enough. Boom. So I start up the engine. I shut down, and I shut down the engine that, that, I, uh, that I had to shut down, and then still recovered. And the bottom line was, got them both the engines going, and then right back into the fight. And I, was, really? I mean, I, sh I should have just been called. I mean, of course, yeah. it, by this time I got eagles all over me. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what? How long does that process take? Because the eagles must have been all over you while you were doing that. Well, they, they're probably just laughing their ass off, saying this, 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 this turkey. You know, the, you know that the nickname for the Tomcat was the turkey. And boy, yeah. talk about talk about a turkey just going out of control. You know, with, you know, 
it's probably stuff coming out of the engines as well. But uh, no, it's just it, again, it's just it's the stupid, you know. You're just stupid when you're young, and and I finally got I got out of that. Last later on, when I started flying the Hornet, uh, later on in life in the career, um, I started getting a little smart because I had my first kid, and I was like, eh, I want him to have a father. So yeah. not, I started not doing so. Many, I, although I still did some stupid stuff, which I can tell you when I stop tell my Hornet stories. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I'm sure we'll get into that. But uh, yeah, so your first squadron was um, the Odd Box, wasn't it? And you also flew um, cap missions in Desert Storm. Can you tell us about yeah. this? Yeah, that was interesting. Um, you know, we were right in the middle of workups when the war started, and I remember having the the, you know, the CAG, which is the Air Wing Commander. He had the big meeting, and they, they accelerated our IDTT, which is the uh, Inter Deployment Training. Uh, yeah, I need, it's been so long since I've been out of the Navy uh, training cycle. And so what it was is I remember he says, hey, we're, we're accelerating. We're going to cruise, stand by, get ready, get everything taken care of because we're probably going to be out there between, you know, because they didn't know how the war was going to go. And they said, we're, we're going to be replacing the uh, the Nimitz battle group. So, we're, you know, of course, we're going through our workups, all the training, you know, and watching the war. How, how's it going? Well, you know, that war went by pretty quick. I mean, it, it showed the, you know, the, the, the how powerful the, the, you know, the U.S. military really is. And, of course, we were not as a U.S. military. It was a joint. And we had we had the RAF with us. We had, uh, God, I think we had, you know, we had everybody with us, you know. So, I mean, it's a quick war. So, by the time we are actually deployed and on the way there, um, the war is over. I mean, we, we got over there. It's, it was still considered desert storm. It was still combat. Uh, you know, consider combat, although it was like, no, I mean, no one's shooting at you. I ain't combat to me, you know, but we still had to have it. There was still a, a requirement that they wanted 24-7 um, combat air patrol over Kuwait. And the rule was nothing was to fly, nothing. And and we had, uh, I think the call sign for the controller, again, it was international. So it was, so we didn't know who would be controlling us. But I think the call, I remember the call sign was we always talked to and we check in. It was Bulldog. And we'd always check in with Bulldog. But we'd be launched out in sections and there'd be a pair of us flying over Kuwait. And by this time, all of Kuwait's on fire. You remember Saddam was saying he 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 ignited all the yeah, oil. All the oil yeah. It was I mean it was so bad. I mean God, you we come back and our our you know our gray toms would be completely black underneath. Wow, we really? Be, yeah, we used flying over watching, and we I got some great shots, pictures of of the stuff at night. It was incredible. You had a night mission because you didn't know which when you'd be launched to go on that mission, cool. and there were long missions. There were like seven hour missions. And uh, you'd refuel, and and you didn't you didn't know when you're going to come back because what had to happen was you actually had to be relieved on station. So you we we just sit there and we'd just be capping for hours and hours. Next thing you know, we're like, being running, so we come and say, "Hey, bulldog, we uh, we need to get some fuel." And they say, hey, and they, they sent a tanker out to us, and then mm -hmm. and then we're thinking, "Okay, is there, are we are we getting relieved?" And you know, no nothing. They they they. they you're back, get back on station. So we just refuel, get back on station, refuel, get back. And so sometimes that's why sometimes we're like seven, seven hour missions. Um, but then what happened was I'm, I'll never forget this one time because we were kind of getting bored with this thing because the war is over. No one's flying. All we're seeing is a burning Kuwait and we're just wasting, we're just boring holes in the sky. And um, and again, you never knew who was going to relieve you. It was going to be your sister squadron, or it was going to be Eagles out of uh, Riyadh. Um, so what ended up happening one time was we're just it's been a long day, long mission, and we're and we're, they said uh, they, you know, we're the VARC. They go VARC uh, one zero one. Uh, your relief is is just getting getting close to the tanker. And, they, and so, but remember, we're relief on station. So we, we have to have them check yeah, in before yeah. we can leave. But he's just giving his heads up there. They're, they're out of Riyadh and they're, you know, Eagles are going to be replacing you. Well, so at this point, we started easing on over to, to where the more, where the carrier was. Oh, we're, right. still, we're still on station. It's like yeah. getting closer. So as soon, as soon as we check in, we're heading home. <clears throat> and so, no, no, no kidding. As soon as and we, and we had already topped off, so we're we're heading that way, and then all of a sudden, Bulldog comes up and says, 
we got a bogey and it was a launch and we're like, wow. and then, and then that's so funny because that's when the, the fangs and the claws come out and now you have two toms with fangs out and then the, the, the hornet <laughs> the, the claws out and next you know they're like boom they're i, I guarantee you they're an afterburner and we're an afterburner and we're, wow. <laughs> we're like competing for the intercept and uh, and, and we both get there and sure enough you know what it was it was it was a un when they had launched a un airplane and but they weren't they weren't squawking and they weren't talking so they they you know that's why they just kept on getting us vectors to go see and so we're like it's a, you know, it's like, it's, it's a UN airplane. So finally, it's, it's, you know, all right, you guys got it. We're going home. So, you know, we went back home, but it was, you know, the storm, it was, uh, yeah, I was, I was there, but I missed everything because the war finished up so quick. I mean, it, it, the, the one thing that was really interesting to see was the, um, what they used to call it. They called it the, uh, highway to hell. Do you, do you remember oh, about that? Uh, was that when they started bombing all the vehicles going on that long mile? Yeah, and yeah. people are that was still, smell it. Yeah, that I mean, because it was just it was it was all still there, and so we yeah. we'd always fly over the highway to hell. I mean, I'll tell you what, that was yeah, that was an incredible incredible view, incredible picture to see uh, yeah. you know, there. So yeah, the guy the guys did some good work there in, in, in eliminating the threat. So yeah, but, I remember that. But I'm going to bore you experience. with a question here, Mark, because, like, okay, so what did you do? Like, so you said uh, seven-hour caps. Were you always alert, or did you just be like, did you see the football last week, or, you know, anything like that? Or, was that, or were you yeah, always... It's, 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 I mean, the, the, the Rio, that's, that, see, that's when, you know, that, that dual-seat uh, relationship is, you know, he runs the radar. I'm just flying the airplane. Now in a dogfight, yeah, I can run part of the radar. I can get some uh, through the radar yeah. in a dogfight, um, and I do that. But for the most part, you know, is an air defense fighter, uh, so they're they're looking long. You know, they're, they're taking the AUG nine and getting a nice scan volume going and trying to pick up anything, looking both high, and low, and, and they're you know he'd be back there working. But yeah, I'd be talking to him, you know. And but that's about it. I, and I'd just be looking. You always you always looking around. But yeah, it was a long. You know, the the worst part about it was is your ass would get sore. The, the ejection seats yeah, are one of the it, most yeah. comfortable seats. And we were trying to do anything. Guys were like going. Then you come back from mission like, God, my ass hurts, you know. And uh, from sitting, in, you know, for seven hours in the, in the cockpit. So some guys were like. Uh, coming up with some innovative things that, you know, we go hunting through the carrier and try to find some, um, you know, those plastic bubble, bubble oh, pops. Oh, yes, yes. So, and so we started to, we started using those. But the funny thing about that was we, we had to stop using that because it felt great at first because you're like, oh, yeah, that, that makes it more comfortable. Uh, but the problem was is your body heats the air inside the, next thing you know, you're, you're, you're like, God, my ass is burning, you know, it, the, the heat, the, the heat of the air, you, you actually feel it through all your, you know, so, and it was, it was, we were there during the uh, summer, it was, it was hot, the, uh, the mean temperature on the carrier um, was 140 degrees, because the carrier is yeah. right smack in the middle of the Persian Gulf yeah. on that dark black, car you know, top carrier, all the you know the steam from the catapults, uh, all the engines operating, all, all those poor guys, the, the maintenance uh, personnel, and the, the controllers, the, the the guys that were taxiing us on the flight deck. I don't know how they did it because we were dying in the uh, in the airplane. I mean, even at full AC, just like you're you're you're. You, we were wearing the, um, the uh, desert cami <clears throat> flight suits, yeah. the brown, light brown. It did turn in like. Dark. It almost looks like you're you're wearing a, a black suit because yeah, of course. It, you fill it with. I mean, you could do it almost just rinse it out. And, and we always had to have just tons of water because you just you'd just be leaving your body. It's not it's so, not glamorous for an F-14 pilot, is it? Nah.